From Beloved by Toni Morrison. There's a loneliness that can be rocked, arms crossed, knees drawn up, holding, holding on this motion, unlike a ship's, smooths and contains the rocker. It's an inside kind, wrapped tight like skin. Then there is a loneliness that roams. No rocking can hold it down. It is alive on its own. A dry and spreading thing that makes the sound of one's own feet going seem to come from a far off place. Everybody knew what she was called, but nobody anywhere knew her name. Disremembered and unaccounted for, she cannot be lost because no one is looking for her. And even if they were, how can they call her if they don't know her name? Although she has claimed, she is not claimed. In the place where long grass opens, the girl who waited to be loved and cries shame erupts into separate parts to make it easy for the chewing laughter to swallow her away. It was not a story to pass up on. So they forgot her, like an unpleasant dream during a troubling sleep. Occasionally, however, the rustle of a skirt hush, hushes when they wake, and the knuckles brushing a cheek in sleep seem to belong to the sleeper. Sometimes the photograph of a close friend or, na or relative looked at too long shifts, and something more familiar that the dear face itself moves there. They can touch if they like, but don't because they know things will never be the same if they do. That is not a story to pass on. Down by the stream in the back of one, two, four, her footprints come and go. They are so familiar. Should a child, an adult, place his feet in them, they will fit. Take them out, they will disappear again as though nobody ever walked there. By and by, all trace is gone, and what is forgotten is not only the footprints, but the water too, and what is down there. The rest is weather, not the breath of the disremembered and accounted for, but wind in the eaves or spring ice thawing too quickly. Just weather, certainly no clamor for a kiss. Beloved. The realization of what would happen next settled gradually over Harry in the long minutes like softly falling snow. I've got to go back, haven't I? Harry asked. That's up to you, replied Dumbledore. I've got a choice. Oh yes, Dumbledore smiled at him. We're in King's Cross, you say? I think that if you decided not to go back, you would be able to, let's say, board a train? And where would it take me? On, said Dumbledore simply. I think, said Dumbledore, that if you choose to return, there is a chance that Voldemort may be finished for good. I cannot promise it. But I know this, Harry, that you have less to fear from returning here than he does. Do not pity the dead, Harry. Pity the living, and above all, those who live without love. By returning, you may ensure that fewer souls are maimed, fewer families are torn apart. And if that seems to you a worthy goal, then we say goodbye for the present. Harry nodded and sighed. Leaving this place would not be nearly as hard as walking into the forest had been, but it was warm and light and peaceful here. And he knew that he was heading back to pain and the fear of more loss. He stood up, and Dumbledore did the same, and they looked for a long moment into each other's faces. Tell me one last thing, said Harry. Is this real? 
or has this been happening inside my head? Dumbledore beamed at him, and his voice sounded loud and strong in Harry's ears, even though the bright mist was descending again, obscuring his figure. Of course it is happening inside your head, Harry. But why on earth should that mean that it is not real? Every year, <laughs> every year, the American Library Association publishes a list of the top 10 most challenged books in the United States. The list is compiled using media reports and voluntary reports sent to the Office of Intellectual Freedom, and for years, there have been some mainstays. The Adventures of Huckleberry Finn by Mark Twain, 1984 by George Orwell, the Harry Potter series, basically anything and everything by Toni Morrison. These classic texts have found their ways into the ire of school boards and parent activist groups. Folks have been warned from various pulp, folks have even been warned from various pulpits all across the world to keep these stories out of the vulnerable clutches of their children for fear of the corruption of their young minds. But why? In this previous year's list, the number one reason for a book being on the list was that it either depicted LGBTQ content or some type of violence. And maybe there might be some truth to wanting to shield children from things. Children should not be exposed to hard things, you could say. A child's mind is flexible and it is malleable. The media that they consume has a lasting impact. But shielding children from this offensive content does not take away from the realities that these stories speak to. It doesn't take away from the realities that young people already live. To those who wish to remove these stories from the public sphere, respectfully, young people are already queer. Young people already know lots of swear words. Young people experience some of the most profane violence at the hands of people who are meant to keep them safe. And some of them, some of them are not even white people. People who tell us not to tell the stories of things that are already happening are deluding themselves into this false perception of safety, of a normalcy that doesn't really exist. They are scared. They are scared of change, and of things not being the way that they think them to be. They are scared of truth being spoken aloud, and perhaps they should be scared. When we encounter the apostles today in our passage from Acts, they've gotten themselves into a little bit of a pickle. Jesus is gone, he's died, he got buried, and then he got up. And now he's gone on to glory and he's left the apostles to do what he's told them to do and they're preaching, and they're telling Jesus' story, and it's life-changing stuff. They're sharing all of their resources with one another. They're putting the fear of God, quite literally, into people's hearts. They're making believers out of men and everyone else. And then right on time, the text tells us that the high priests are filled with jealousy, and they arrest the apostles and throw them into the public prison took them to Rikers. And then again, like clockwork, an angel of the Lord shows up and opens the prison gates and frees them. Frees every single person in that prison and sends the apostles to the temple to continue to preach. The prison guards and the priests are obviously shocked and confused, and who wouldn't be when they think that they have the upper hand? People who subvert the unjust rules of society are very rarely given the peace to do so. That's what, this question, that's what this questioning by the high priest in the Sanhedrin is. How dare you? Who do you think y'all are? Why are you making us look bad? Do you know who we are? And Peter's answer isn't helpful for the priests or their intentions, especially in what I'm assuming to be quite a public questioning. 
Peter responds, we must obey God rather than any human authority. And because we have been witnesses to the life and the work of Jesus Christ, the Holy Spirit has come down and it blesses all of those who obey God. That is, we must speak. We have no other choice. Now, for clarity's sake, I, as I'm making an illustration, and I'm not making a one-on-one -on -one comparison um, between books that get banned in our current public sphere and the apostles um, and what the apostles have charged with um, doing. I'm not suggesting that there's currently a crusade against the Bible or the Word of God. At least for us, as Christians in this time and in this place, this persecution against preaching is not true. The reality of our laws and our various privileges do not support this particular notion. We are not being prohibited from preaching the word of God. There, ha there is, however, there are, however, folks who are currently working very hard and succeeding in an effort to restrict how we tell stories and what stories are able to be told. One of my very first clergy bosses helped me to understand our interconnectedness with the stories of the Bible in what I've always felt as a really beautiful way. He said that our world, our word, our word consisted of two books, the little book and a big book. The Bible is the little book. It is the true and unchanged word of God that tells the story of God's people who have come before us, as well as the life and work of Jesus Christ and his emerging church. It's perfect. The big book, on the other hand, is us. It's our lives in this day. It is our journeys and our stories and our striving and failing sometimes to live out in the ways that Jesus has asked us to. The apostles lived in a very different time from us. They had just lost Jesus in an extremely violent and public manner, and everyone knew it. Everyone knew who they were and what they were doing. They were telling a story that was only just, begin, being, only, only just begun to be written down. They were straddling this line between the little book and the big book of God. So why are the priests over in the Sanhedrin so upset? Why are parents and politicians upset when they call to remove books from their children's libraries? I'm not sure that those who have historically worked to limit the stories that get told are worried about their own personal stories being told. After all, we have loads and loads and loads of stories of the glories of empire. The names of the men who built this city, this country, and, very mu and are very much adorned all over the streets and buildings we encounter. Members of school boards and elected officials are overwhelmingly still not representative of the majority of their constituents and the students that they care over. People in power, by virtue of their said power, always get their stories told. But what is it about these stories of others, stories of those that are not at the center of power, those whose stories are not at the forefront of our public imagination, that could warrant them not being told? Can a story like Beloved be both a tough and heartbreaking story of abuse and poverty and self-preservation in the face of a newfound freedom and also be an indictment of the cruel system that permitted those ills? Can Harry Potter be about a young boy whose circumstances change when he discovers magic and also be about an abused orphan who spends the latter part of his childhood exploring the world of his inheritance in a universe that he could have never imagined? Can a story like To Kill a Mockingbird be the story about unjust racial persecution in our court systems, not just in the South, but all over the world where people are not given the chance to defend themselves. In a 2016 interview with Krista Tippett's On Being radio show, beloved pastor and Bible translator Eugene Peterson mused on the power of words. He noted that we live in a world where we cannot be afford to be lazy with how we use our words. They are simply too powerful. Peterson, who, um, 
whose life's big work, one of his life's big work, is the message translation of the Bible. Um, he began that work of translating the Bible into a, a words that were more receivable for his congregants because he said that he realized he was pastoring to people who no longer read. They weren't, re not only were they not perhaps reading the Bible, which is fine, <laughs> but they weren't reading, they weren't experiencing the Bible as this like huge um, canon of poetry and in music and they weren't experiencing the Bible the way that he experienced the Bible. So he had to make it plain. He had to make it plain in a way that would allow them to see this beauty and another way of understanding the divine. He had to speak their language. So much of our congregational life is situated in a Sunday morning interaction. It is a very convenient design for the lives that we live and perhaps a test of how willing or able we are to truly get to experience this written word of God. Words mean things. They're so important to us. Jesus, the word, transforms us and continues to do so. So church, as we alleluia our way into the Easter season, what words are you putting into the ground to create a new thing? What story of truth do you have that will grow into the most beautiful life? What can you recreate out of the words that God has given you? And arche and ho logos, kai ho logos and pros tontheon, kai theos and ho logos. In the beginning was the word and the word was with God and the word was God. Amen. One more thing, gentlemen, before I quit. Thomas Jefferson once said that all men are created equal, a phrase that the Yankees and the distaff side of the executive branch of Washington are fond of hurling at us. There is a tendency in this year of grace, 1935, for certain people to use this phrase out of context to satisfy all conditions. The most ridiculous example I can think of is that the people who run public education promote the stupid and idle along with the industrious. Because all men are created equal, educators will gravely tell you, the children left behind suffer terrible feelings of inferiority. We know all men are not created equal in the sense that some people would have us believe. Some people are smarter than others. Some people have more opportunity because they're born with it. Some men make more money than others. Some ladies make better cakes than others. Some people are born gifted beyond the normal scope of most men. But there is one way in this country in which all men are created equal. There is one human institution that makes a pauper the equal of a Rockefeller, the stupid man the equal of Einstein, the ignorant man the equal of any college president. That institution, gentlemen, is a court. It can be the Supreme Court of the United States or the humblest justice of the peace court in the land or this honorable court which you serve. Our courts have their faults, as does any human institution, but in this country, our courts are the great leveler. And in our courts, all men are created equal. I'm no idealist to believe firmly in the integrity of our courts and in the jury system. That is no ideal to me. It is a living, working reality. Gentlemen, a court is no better than each man of you sitting before me on this jury. A court is only as sound as its jury, and a jury is only as sound as the men who make it up. I am confident that you gentlemen will review without passion the evidence you have heard, come to a decision, and restore this defendant to his family. In the name of God, 
do your duty